Coming up on Books Alive, please join me as I sit down with the terrific author of Ella Enchanted, Gail Carson Levine. She and I are going to take a great journey through all the books that she's written for girls and for boys. Please join me. Thank you so much for joining us and it is my very great privilege and pleasure to be able to introduce our wonderful audiences to the terrific Gail Carson Levine. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's great to be here. This is going to be so much fun. I actually was out book talking fifth grade students this spring and early summer and um, I went into Clarksville Elementary and a young lady raised her hand as soon as I got up to speak and said, are you going to have Gail Carson Levine on your show? And I said, wow, that's a great idea. And so here we are, thanks to that wonderful fan of yours out there. And uh, I see that, I think we're going to start with your very brand new book, which is called Ever. Um, when I read it, I was so impressed with what a tremendous love story it is. And I felt like, you know, that was a, such a great thing for you to venture into. But no fairies. No fairies. It's Mesopotamia. I don't think there were fairies in Mesopotamia. <laughs> so we went into mythology instead. Yeah. Any, any reason why we went that way? Um, I read the Bible for the first time. I never had. Oh, wow. And um, I read the... Old Testament and then the New Testament and um, I was very struck by the story of Jephthah and his daughter which is a troubling story in uh, Judges and um, in talking about it with friends who are religious I had some um, insight about it but also it seemed to me that the direction that I was going was a direction that I needed to move away from the biblical source and go into um, a related area and that's what got me to ancient Mesopotamia and then I started to read some of the Mesopotamian myths and to reread the Greek myths Wow! and um, that's where it got its start and all that came together for you now she ends up making a tremendous sacrifice and has 30 days to live. Um, I, I got such a sense in this of a message coming from you about fate and um, how hope alone can't really change fate. But if we take action, we can change fate. Was that me reading into it or was that in there? Oh, I think that's in there. That's interesting. Uh, everybody brings something else to a book. Um, I think um, the source of, of stories for me, as well as the, you know, the biblical basis in this case, are fairy tales and others, but also I think they come out of my subconscious. Mm. And in this case, I think it's, and it, the, the father, Kezi's father, attempts to control something that he can't control, mm -hmm. and he does something very rash. Mm -hmm. And we all try to control the things that we can't control. And it's that that I think connects us to ancient Mesopotamia. It's that vulnerability. And I think that's where, what the book came out of. Wow. It's very powerful. Thank and you. I know I read in your wonderful book, I'm just going to pick this up for a minute, Writing Magic. We'll come back to it in a minute. But you talked about how you have to be a very mean author to write a good book and that you want to kind of keep your characters in hot water all the time. And most certainly she is in hot water a great deal of the time. <laughs> yes, I think my job as an author is to make my characters suffer. <laughs> and I, I want them to suffer because I want my readers to suffer and I want my readers to suffer so that they don't close the book. <laughs> and they'll keep going. <laughs> well, that's really great. You know, the covers on these look so much the same. It's almost like they're sisters. Mm -hmm. This is Fairest, 
And um, the, the, let's see, the main character is Asia. Am I pronouncing that? Asa. Asa, that's right. Okay, and she has a beautiful voice, but not necessarily a beautiful face or a beautiful body. Um, was that in, intentional? Were you going for that? Yes. Uh, when I started to write, it's based on Snow White. And I reread the Grimm's version, and in that there's a queen who's sitting at a window and it's snowing. She pricks her finger and bleeds onto the snow and thinks, oh, how wonderful it would be if I could have a daughter with lips as red as my blood, skin as white as my snow, as the snow, and um, hair as black as my ebony sewing frame. And I thought, oh my, that's hideous. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where it came from. And, and I, I do remember her going out into the forest, and I, that so rang true with, with the Snow White and, and how she goes yeah. out with the woodsman or whatever. Now, Ivy in here, on the other hand, is, is beautiful, or at least has the illusion of beauty. But there's an emptiness about this girl. Yes. Or this woman. So I got the sense of the... Um, well, there was the pursuit of beauty by Aza when she goes into the library and turns herself into stone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that didn't work out so well for her. No, she <laughs> suffered. Yes, <laughs> that was hard, and she definitely stays in hot water too. Well, I, again, totally enjoyed them. And uh, what age do you think that you're writing for there? I think it's. I think Harper says eight to. I'd say eight and up. Eight and up. Whereas Ever is definitely ten and up. Okay. What What's the difference there? Uh, uh, the crisis of the book, the, the, what sets it in motion, I think is troubling. Okay. And I think younger kids might have, might, for one thing, not be interested, mm -hmm. and for another might be troubled. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely an eye grabber when it, when it happens. You're like, whoa. All right. Oh, I wanted to grab The Two Princesses of Bamar. I have loved this book for so many years. And I wanted to tell you, I had a pair of sisters come into the library within the last two months. And when I was telling them about this, they were nine and eight. They, and I said, well, they're two sisters, and one's brave, and the other one's afraid of everything. They said, oh, we live that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. They, they knew who they were, and they owned right up to it. Uh -huh. <laughs> so here they are. Um, let's see. We're, we're, we've got um, Adele. Addie. Addie, that's right. It's Addie and, and her brave sister. Meryl. Who ends up with the gray death. Right. Oh, my goodness. And, um, and it's time for Addie to step up. Yes. Yeah, so Addie is the shy, timid sister. And uh, the brave sister gets this awful disease that's in, believed to be incurable. And so face your fears? Face your fears, yes, that's right. And don't be afraid to go forward. Yeah, I thought that was tremendous. Um, I want to grab the wish here. This, this has been one of my favorites to hand to girls. You know, I'd never hand it to boys, mm -hmm. but I certainly hand it to girls. She's there in the subway and helps the older lady and then gets her wish. And what you have that lady say to her, is it wise? Yeah. I thought, wow because we're about to learn how wise it is. And where did this come from? Where did the idea for this come from? Well, it's about popularity in the eighth grade. And um, I was never in the eighth grade. I skipped eighth grade, but oh I repeated kindergarten, so it worked out. <laughs> um, but um, I did have a very unpopular tenth grade, and it came out of that feeling. And there's a part in it where Wilma's the main character, and she walks to school. It takes place in New York City from the subway every day, and she's alone amongst crowds of friends. And that was my experience every morning. I think a lot of people can relate to that. Now, I think we're going to take a short break here, but when we come back, we're going to be taking a look at a book that won the Newbery Honor Award and also became a tremendous movie, and that book is Ella Enchanted.
global warming. Some say irreversible consequences are 30 years away. 30 years? That won't affect me. And I'm back with Gail Carson Levine. And Gail, this book has just enchanted so many girls since it was written in, what, 1997? Is that right? That's when it was published. Okay. Yes. And won the Newbery Honor Award. Mm. This must be a good friend to you. Oh, yes. Yes, Ella's uh, a gift that keeps giving. <laughs> <laughs> now, do girls write you about this after they read it? Yeah. What, yeah. what do you hear? Well... Um, the the thing that I hear about my favorite um, letter, which could be about Ella or one of my other books, is I didn't like to read until I read whatever book it was. Oh wow! And that's and now I'm a big reader. That's my favorite kind of letter. But there have been kids, and I've also heard from parents about how Ella has been the comfort book for a lot of kids. And one parent wrote to me and said that um, that I think it was a father. He and his wife were getting divorced, and his daughter was going through a rough patch, and she mm -hmm. was leaning on Ella a lot, and could I sign wow. one and um, send it back to them, which, of course, I did. So that's that always means a lot to me. What do you think was the dynamic that she was leaning on? Can you Did you get any sense of that? Well, Ella goes through a lot, mm -hmm. but she's very much like everybody, because we all, Ella is cursed with obedience, and everyone on earth is cursed with obedience. Maybe not the Queen of England, uh, <laughs> but most of us are. And, um, and children, more than anyone else, are cursed with obedience. So, and, and she struggles against it, but she struggles against it with enormous humor. So, and uh, with herself intact. So I think that that's got to be comforting. And also it's a fun book. Mm -hmm. So it's a good place to go when, you're, um, when things in the real world aren't, uh, aren't what you'd like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit tough. Now, I know when you wrote this, Writing Magic, you said in there that no book is perfect and that an author can't seek perfection. And are there, let's take Ella Enchanted, is there a part of Ella Enchanted that after you wrote it, you were, and still to this day, you just felt like, well, I didn't quite get that the way I wanted it, or? Well, I like, I like Ella a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I can't reread a page of any of my books without wanting to change something. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, you just get to a point where it's it's done enough. Mm -hmm. um, I like the end, but it could have kept going until ah. um, she didn't have to overcome her curse at that moment. Mm -hmm. It could have waited until she was at the point of getting married mm. or until there was an actual threat mm -hmm. on, um, on Char. So, um, so I don't know if I ended at the right place. You, you make another point in your book, Writing Magic, which is such a great guide for people who want to become writers. And, and you talked about the fault-finding chatter and how there's the voice in your head that's, you know, says, well, told you you couldn't paint and you, this was lousy and you needed to stop. And you say that you now say that voice will run, but you say, let me finish this and then you can say what you want at the end. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Does that still operate for you? Oh, yes. That, I think, more than anything else is what I want to get across in that book. Because um, it, I, was, I painted and I drew before I started writing, and I was much too self-critical. And I never understood what I was doing to myself as a painter. Hmm. It wasn't until I started writing um, and read a book called um, Writing on Both Sides of the Brain that I came to understand it. And I'd like kids to understand that before they're in their 40s. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think we can all learn from that. I loved the part that said that voice is no more an authority than the one that says you can do it. You know, yeah. it's like you've got to listen to both sides. Now, I know that this book is very, very special to you, David Knight, because it's based on your father. And boy, this is a powerful book. Just a wonderful book. The, um, and the setting with Harlem and, and having him go down to the rent parties and everything, yeah. that was really exciting and fun. How did this one come to you? Well, my father was an orphan um, who grew up in an orphanage. And Dave, in the book, is an orphan who's sent to an orphanage to live. And uh, my father never talked about his orphanage experience, mm. and, or uh, very little. And I think he had a very unhappy time there. Mm -hmm. um, but my father was the happiest person I've ever known. Wow. So I wrote the book to explain. It was after he died. Mm -hmm. I started writing it after he died. Mm -hmm. And it was to explain the person that he became. And I don't think he had adventures. I'm quite sure he didn't have adventures in the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. But the orphanage was located... Today it would be Harlem, then it was very close to Harlem, and, um, and it was, for my father, at the very beginning of the Harlem Renaissance. For this character, it's right in the middle of it. And that Dave is an amazing character because he and his brother lose dad, and the brother, Gideon, I think it was, gets chosen to go off with Uncle Jack, and it's Dave who gets shunted off into the Hebrew orphanage. And he figures out the good stuff that's in there. That was really great. And I loved how you made him good at drawing because he figures out who he is. Yeah. And what his talent is. I mean, it's like all this goodness just starts glowing out of this book. It was very um, uplifting. Oh, good. Yeah. Good, good. In that way. Yeah. That was really good. Well, speaking of talents... Let's turn to this young lady, Fairy Dust and the Quest for the Egg. The laugh, the baby's laugh, comes winding around and born from that is wonderful Prilla. Yeah. And she's supposed to say what her talent is upon arrival. Can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we take a little journey. Where did that one come from? Well, the laugh, the, uh, it's the fairies of Neverland. And... A uh, baby's first laugh turning into a fairy is from James M. Barry, who wrote Peter Pan. So um, I just used it. But um, the books um, were originated, came about because I was asked to write about these fairies by some editors at Disney. Ah. And, um, and I was asked to invent a world for them within the world of Peter Pan. Oh. And Peter Pan was one of my very favorite books when I was little. And um, I think I was in love with Peter. I wanted to marry oh. Peter. I thought Wendy was an idiot for going home. <laughs> and to be invited back to Neverland was very exciting. So um, it was a lot of fun to do that. And um, the editors showed me some drawings that they had come up with. And one was of a light fairy and one was of a gardening fairy. And so I thought, well, maybe the fairies could have talents. And that's where their talents came from. And this is a bit younger, uh, the audience, than I would say most of these. Yeah, as I think it probably works as a read aloud mm -hmm. um, for if a child is really good at following a story as young as five. Okay. Uh, which is that's probably great. true of my princess tales as well. And your princess tales, your sense of humor just comes echoing out of these books. It's just fabulous. Where is the fairy's mistake? Yeah. I just think this is mm. hilarious. Oh my gosh. You've got the one with the all the jewels every time she speaks. I loved the part where the prince puts her on the horse with a saddlebag open <laughs> so as they ride off to the castle and she speaks they, they can catch all these gemstones. <laughs> and then the other one who's got the snakes and the bugs falling out, she almost gets herself in a better place yeah. than the one with the gems. What a, what a great twist on that, that old story. 
That was just wonderful. And where did you get the idea to do that? Well, when I reread Toads and Diamonds, which is the story that it came from, mm -hmm. the, in this original story, the pretty sister has, uh, the pretty sweet sister has, uh, does a favor for a fairy and has jewels and flowers coming out of her mouth. Mm -hmm. And the prince falls in love with her pretty sweetness. But I thought, nah, that's not what he falls in love with. Uh -huh. He falls in love with that. I mean, he's just seen her. Right. He doesn't have time to fall in love with anything except the jewels. Right. So I thought that was the way it should go. And then I thought, well, maybe the other sister can make the uh, snakes and insects that are coming out of her mm -hmm. work for her. Mm -hmm. and, and also, it's great fun to write about those things coming out of your mouth. Yes. Well, the bug and snake races that then increase tourism in the village are pretty <laughs> great, too. That was pretty funny. So make the best of whatever you have, and even the, the punishments might end up being good. The fairies return. Well, this was hilarious, too. I'm trying to pronounce that word, fiffer, 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 fiffer. Fiffafala? Yes. Fuffala. Fuffala. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, and you're supposed to say that over and over and over again. <laughs> Uh huh. That was great. And he ends up with all those people stuck to the goose. What is the story that this one is? That's the golden goose. The golden goose. And such a great, I mean, boys must enjoy these too with your sense of humor. Boys do enjoy them. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they have trouble getting past the word fairy. Uh -huh. uh, there is one that's a male Cinderella story. That's Cinderella's in the Glass yes, Hill. Yes, I've got that right and here. And boys go to that. Uh huh. And I, I'm hoping that if they like that, they'll go on to the others because the humor is boy humor, girl humor, it's anybody's humor. Mm -hmm. Which One of them had the two brothers. Is that this one? That's that one. And yes. they, they, they make up that uh, rhyme to get rid of the, no, the goblins. Yes. And it's something like, go away goblins, go, 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 away, away, away. You know, and then he says, it's really hard to remember the words. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is so funny. It was so great. Well, Gail, you have so many treasures here for so many children of all ages. And I would imagine that you are many people's absolute favorite author. So thank you so much for giving our kids all these. Have you got anything in the works right now? I'm finishing, I'm very happy to say, <laughs> the um, third book in the Disney um in the Disney series. Okay. And um, anything else bubbling around? I'm thinking I'm also working sort of on the side. I can do this in the shower and when I'm walking down the street uh -huh. of a book of very mean poems. Oh, <laughs> oh great. For children? Yes. Oh, oh definitely. how wonderful. Definitely. How, well, we will look forward to that. That's great. Thanks so much for being with, with me today. And I know our audience is just thoroughly going to enjoy getting to know you a little bit more. Well, thank you for having me. So, you know, if you're out and looking for something good in the library, there ha I know there was something here today that probably caught your eye or your ear, whether you're a girl or a boy. Come on in. We've got more, many more to share with you. And come see us at the library.